The late 1970s and early 80s were a tumultuous time for civil rights in the United States and in Oklahoma. Following closely on the heels of the anti-war movement and the fight for equal rights for people of color, the women's and gay rights movements were gaining momentum and support, as well as opposition. One of the most visible fights for women's rights was in the form of the proposed Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would have prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. In 1981, Oklahoma was one of four states targeted as an easy state to win ratification of the amendment due to its supportive governor, Speaker of the House, and President Pro Tem. Outside influences, most notably now on the pro-ERA side, and Phyllis Schlafly and the Eagle Forum on the anti-ERA side helped organize locals and campaigned heavily in the state. In the end, Schlafly and the anti-ERA organizations changed Oklahoma's perception of the amendment and the ratification vote in 1982 was lost. Many of the women who would eventually form Herland were involved in the fight for passage of the ERA. Gay rights were another hot-button civil rights issue in the 19... To counter the push for gay rights, sodomy laws, which had originated to prevent non-procreative sex or sex outside of marriage, began to be used in a new way in the late 19... Some states rewrote sodomy laws and others enforced them in such a way that the laws would only apply to gay people. Social conservatives then cited sodomy laws as one justification for discrimination against gays. The laws were used in various states, including Oklahoma, to limit the ability of gay people to raise their own children, to adopt, or become foster parents. The laws were also used to justify firing gay people or denying gay people jobs. Jerry Falwell's moral majority Pat Robertson, Pat Buchanan, and others rallied the Christian right to oppose any societal acceptance of gays and lesbians. In 1978, Oklahoma legislators considered a bill known as the Helm Law, so named for its sponsor, Mary Helm, that authorized Oklahoma schools to fire teachers for engaging in any public homosexual conduct or activity including advocating for gay rights. Anita Bryant had launched her nationwide Save Our Children campaign in 1977 and lobbied state lawmakers to pass the Helm Bill, which it did overwhelmingly. The National Gay Task Force filed a class action suit against the Oklahoma City Board of Education to challenge this statute. The appellate court ruling affirmed that public homosexual activity, such as physical acts of a homosexual nature, could be prohibited, but conduct, such as exercising free speech rights, could not. The task force appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which included Justice Rehnquist, who had publicly compared homosexuality to a contagious disease requiring a quarantine. When the Oklahoma case reached the court in January 1985, it was the first time oral arguments had been heard by the nation's highest court over any gay rights issue. With one justice absent, the lower court ruling was upheld by a 4-4 four to -four Supreme Court split vote. Oklahoma public schools continued to require teachers to sign a moral turpitude clause it was into these tumultuous times that Herland was born. Oklahoma women involved in the ERA and other women's and gay rights activism 
were the initial founders of Herland. In the early 1980s, Herland was started as a retail bookstore selling books from independent presses such as Nyad Press and women's music from Olivia Records and other labels. Herland was located at Northwest 19th Street and Blackwelder in a rented storefront of an elderly woman's house. After a few years of operation, the Herland Collective was formed and incorporated as a nonprofit organization. Herland activities grew to include a monthly newsletter, coffee houses featuring local poets and musicians, a lending library, concerts by nationally known women musicians, and twice a year retreats at state parks. And after I moved to the city, um, began involved to be involved in the efforts to take what had been Herland Bookstore, which was, you know, uh, a private business that Barbara Cleveland and some others had had started to take over from an earlier feminist bookstore called La Salle de Femme. Um, and I got involved in the process of, of turning that uh, from Barbara's business to a collective, uh, a women to own collective. When we started, and I, I'll go back to the bookstore notion, because when we started the bookstore, we couldn't buy those books, right? Nobody, you, I mean, if you didn't have a local place to go, you didn't have a full circle bookstore that would have things, you certainly didn't have anything like Amazon or all the other resources. Herland started producing the music since I was a music producer. And there's an artist out there, Gil Marie. She's out in California. And uh, we had to have my very first one. Uh, it's not the first one. We had to have a piano. And one of my friends had a piano in the house. So we loaded the piano in my van and we took it over. And I took a chance. This time I had that concert at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center Faculty Club. Decided to use my other side of me. And I rented the faculty club and we had this big concert. But there were a lot of rooms in the faculty club. Huh. So I asked the local artists that were around, would you consider playing? And I can't pay you, but you can bring a couple of friends. You can have some of the munchies and all of it. And I had local artists calling me. Somebody told somebody something. We filled up all those rooms. And they started like the main concert and we fixed the dining room up for the main concert. We started at six o'clock and people wandered around and they drank wine and they ate the little snacks and they went from one room to the next room to the next room. Right, we had like four rooms artists in. And they just wandered around. Big gathering. It was like so much fun. And then we had the concert. Yep, that was good too. I got involved with Herland, I think, in 1983, which was right about at the beginning. We were still over on 19th Street then, 19th and Black Welder, in the front of a little house that the owner lived in the back of. And we were allowed to use the front for the bookstore. And so it began as a bookstore. We, it was open on Saturdays for about six hours, I think, like from 10 to 4 and on Sundays from one to five. But we did have, among other things we did, we had consciousness raising sessions, CR. We'd get in there and we'd uh, raise our consciences. And we'd realize some of the things that we just took for granted. Just like sort of today, people have been going along, getting harassed and we're seeing the actresses who were so badly um, sexualized by by people in Hollywood. Well, I really, until the Me Too started and it came out, I don't think it was, uh, they really didn't know. It's, you can't heal a wound if you don't know you have a wound. So that's what the CR was about. But but that was a part of the mission too. At the point where we uh, developed the non we the corporation, we, we uh, also had some nonprofit, and, and basically it's an educational organization. 
which uh, there was plenty of education to be done <laughs> in Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of issues were coming up, uh, uh, and uh, this was a way to get people together and to get them thinking about what was happening and, and what could be done to make things a little bit better living in Oklahoma. We definitely, you know, we needed a place where we could meet and talk about ideas and share ideas and get support from others. Okay, you know, I'm going through this at my job. And somebody would say, well, I'm here for you. Try this, give me a call, call this person because he or she, usually she might be able to help, but it, it was safe. Her land was a place where you could go and meet other people who were um, like-minded and like feeling. Yeah. You're going, oh my God, what am I doing? And, uh, but Herland was a nice place because you could go and actually be with other people who understood what you were feeling. So Herland was a, a shining beacon in the middle of this dark desert highway because it was like nothing. In the beginning, it was like to have a space where you could go in and not have to put on the, all of those facets of all the bullshit was very nice, very nice, even beyond nice, but, um, it was, it was invaluable. I don't think cops go in and bust people in bars anymore. When I first moved here, they did. You know, you could be sitting in a bar holding hands with your girlfriend or dancing on the floor and the lights would flash <clears throat> and you knew cops were coming in. And so people scattered. They sat very stoically with their, with their drink in their hand, not touching anybody sitting to either side nobody on the dance floor, the cops would walk in, and that's very intimidating. We did sort of roving bookstores, so we'd pack up books and we'd take them places. Uh, we had people who uh, would help us with uh, enough money to buy books so that we could go to, say, the Better Women's uh, Association conference or to some event so we could take books to sell because we didn't have any money. We didn't have any, you know, anything, any resources to really work with, but we had just this, this little space um, that was our space and we did the books and we also did one of the one of the really important things we did uh, was producing women's music con concerts so um, because those those kinds of things everything we did was about providing a space a safe space for lesbians and women in general and uh, that was not something you could find very many places. There were bars, but for there to be a space that identified itself as feminist and and women oriented, and you know there was even there was fear around being really very specifically lesbian, uh, even though most of us who were in, involved uh, certainly identified that way. But there was fear around it. But to be a feminist women's organization was in itself a radical thing to do. I mean, it was a time when when to be a woman and to be lesbian meant that um, you you lived with all sorts of, of fear. I mean, I had been, when I was in Ada, right after I graduated with my master's degree in psychology, um, I worked with the Battered Women Shelter in Ada. This was, Reagan was president at the time worked with the Battered Women's Shelter in Ada. I worked on the um, ERA ratification campaign uh, for Oklahoma in Ada. And shortly after the ERA ratification failed, I was a part of what really was a national event and where, where lesbians were systematically purged from the Battered Women's Movement. So there was also, so I got fired. Um, and that was really part of the impetus for moving to Oklahoma City. So it was a time where, where there weren't many safe places for us. Um, there were very few safe places for us. Uh, Herland was kind of a concept, and we saw a little flyer for it at a local lesbian bar, DJ's, and I can't remember, um, totally remember, it probably said some sort of Organizational meeting, organizational meeting for a 
feminist bookstore or something like that. I mean, I really think the word feminist was in the title. Well, the very beginning, her land was over on, oh, I think it was 17th and Blackwell, or it might have been 18th and Blackwell. And that was where I first was at her land. And then um, I wasn't a member of the group that bought this house, but I later got on the board after that when we still had that building and was involved in selling it and clearing what we used to go over there and clear the brush and mow and try to keep it from getting sighted by the city because it, it had sort of fallen in and we kind of had to either clear the land off or sell it so we sold it real quick and for almost nothing. Prior to becoming involved in Herland, I didn't know anything about women's music, so it was an eye-opening experience for me. Particularly at the retreats, we had a lot of women musicians performing, but then we brought in bigger name musicians, and um, those were pretty successful events and things that kind of brought the brought everybody together. The newsletter was mailed to women all over the state, all over the country, really, and at that time. There weren't very many avenues to get thought-provoking ideas out to people, and so the newsletter, we tried really hard to make that a, a substantial content. Oh, I've been in town for, you know, well over 25 years, and when I first got to town, I heard of her land, and uh, I was kind of... Um, I was by then, you know, several years into lesbian relationships, but still, um, you know, just coming into town, I didn't know exactly what the community was, the lesbian community. And so I said, well, go check out her land. And there were a couple of things like activities going on. And I didn't immediately, you know, become involved or a frequent flyer with it, but it was like, okay, I know it's here. and. Um, you know, it was just kind of needed. So her land, for me, the safety is just being able to be yourself as you would in your home. It was a big part of our mission, you know, we're talking about all those people who got that information in the newsletter. So, you know, you got somebody sitting out in Eric, Oklahoma, who's getting that kind of information and getting that kind of perspective, and they're sure not seeing it or hearing it anywhere else. Right. I, for years, I typed it and stripped it and took it to Kinko's and we ran it off. That's the old-fashioned way. And then we got together <laughs> computers. and folded and we had to, parties. Done, yeah, yeah. We had done our address labels. <laughs> we typed them too and sent them out. And uh, But it, it was a wonderful opportunity to reach a lot of people that we didn't even see that often, but once they'd sign up for the newsletter, you know, we could let them know. One of our older members who lived in Norman and Hunt University had gone away on vacation, and so she had them hold her mail, and while she was gone, the newsletter came, and when she got back, there were a number of people who worked in the post office down there that made threats to her because of her being on this list of us getting this subversive <laughs> newsletter, you know, and just, you know, you are a teacher at, at OU and you certainly should not be spreading these ideas. There's, there was always a newsletter from before the time Herland was an incorporated organization. There was always a newsletter and it was a way just to maintain touch with a lot of people. Um, in the old days, the we sent the newsletter out in these little brown paper bags. Have you seen those bags? I think there are relics around. So those little flat brown paper bags that we stuffed it in because, you know, it couldn't land in somebody's mailbox again. The safe space thing it couldn't land in somebody's mailbox unwrapped. And the newsletter was always a way to give people information about the organization, but we always try to connect people to more than that, to talk about issues and to be, um, you know, it wasn't just about raising money for um, Herland or getting people to come to a Herland event, but it was getting, but 
was giving them information and connecting them to, to broader topics. It was always an attempt to be um, a feminist perspective and to give people a feminist perspective. Yes, the first retreat I sang, Mary Reynolds and I were the singers, and it was, I think it was at, it was either at Osage Hills, I think it was Osage Hills, it was a really small state park. Um, I wasn't involved in the board at that time, but the people had um, gotten, you know, reserved a state park, and it was sort of a small one. And we went and we had a wonderful retreat and did neat things and met each other. We made a lot of lifelong friends at that retreat. And uh, we continued to have retreats once or twice a year for years and years. And I went to a lot of the early ones, like in the 80s and early 90s. And they were quite an event. We, we, we had music from like the women's music circuit, really famous women's music people came and uh, we hired them and they would play. So everything was focused around the music being the evening thing and then we had workshops in the day and a potluck meal in the evening and they were spectacular events. For the retreats, the retreats started, I think, not very long actually after Herlin was incorporated as a nonprofit, and we really so a few of us four or five of us had gone to a retreat in arkansas sponsored by the arkansas women's project and it was like wow this is cool because it was a space where um they had gone to a state park and just had a group of women and everybody took care of everything and it was a collective kind of experience. So we thought, we can do something like this. Herland itself, the building, was not a woman-only space. Uh, some men, especially the wonderful Paul Thompson and Terry Gatewood, were, spent a good deal of time there um, in meetings and things. Uh, they didn't work the store or anything. The retreats were women-only. And this is because a lot of women, well, to this day also, but especially maybe back in the 80s, uh, had been injured by men. And, yeah, it's just the same today, actually. But having women-only space gave them a chance out at Roman Nose at the park or something to completely relax and not have to worry about any triggering. We, we, didn't, we didn't have that word then. But, um, but that's what we, one thing we were staying safe from was being triggered. Uh, the, the idea of the uh, group camps were that uh, we charge the person's ability to pay. You know, it would be basically a voluntary situation. And then we would do communal meals. Everybody brought fixings for uh, <laughs> massive cooking. They have, uh, all the camps have uh, kitchens uh, where you can cook and walk-in coolers, places where you can bring things. And then uh, we had lots of programs, mostly local musicians, and people would also speak about subject matter that they knew and could be helpful to, uh, to our community. Uh, I have very good memories of the retreats, and um, I remember that they provided an opportunity for me, who uh, I was a single mother and a full-time teacher and a part-time counselor and here was this weekend that sometimes I would get away and just lay on the cot and read all weekend or for hours at a time. I loved that. And I loved the music. The music was phenomenal. I think we got exposed to a lot of really wonderful musicians because of of Herland um, and the concerts that they were able to.
can we settle down? Being alone with the lights turned low. Oh, you pull down the shades. And I hear you say that no one will know that I'm stepping in through the back. Let myself in to a world of love, 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 love. You know it's not right when nobody finds out. And while she's stepping out, I'm stepping in through the back door to heaven. That's all. She's by your side. Whoa, we both turn our heads. Nothing is said. We pass right on by. The sun goes down and the stars are bright. Whoa, my telephone rings. Want me to meet you later tonight? And Back to the heaven. Let myself in. But they were trying to do a consensus model, so I had to leave, you know, after a while because it couldn't come to consensus. I think that there are some things that consensus works with, and a lot of things that consensus doesn't work with. I know it's different now, but when we were incorporated for many years, the, the uh, structure of the board was set up to be a collective. So we're a collective operating by consensus, um, and that was really important to who we were and who we, um, because 
it was our organization it didn't belong to any one person it didn't we had certainly there were people who who took leadership roles but didn't belong to anything the way the the uh, officers work was it was a rotation you signed up so you started as sister three and you worked your way through there in a six-month rotation so nobody was in one place too long um, it was long enough that hopefully people learned the job but not so long that anybody got control that it became you know that that person became identified with that function and that was really important part of the, the collectivism um, making that happen it was always difficult that transition and consensus decision making always did. I first went to a Herland kind of beginning meeting, I think it was October of 1982, wow. and then was not really much a part of it for very personal reasons, and probably 84, maybe 85. And then I um, got involved with the board, and I don't necessarily work that well with others <laughs> sometimes and but I learned a whole lot about working with people um, by being on the Herland board but the the thing I really liked about it was there was a, a woman named Kathy who was really um, reluctant to get into that rotation because she didn't want to be sister one but I don't remember if she was behind me or what, but I, I felt like I was kind of nurturing her along, and it was a really cool way to do things. One of the other things about Herland that I think is really important, and kind of fits in this sort of talking about the collective consensus model, is that in terms of the women who are involved, we are all very different. We come from very different backgrounds. Some of us are highly educated people. Some of us know little education. Uh, you don't qualify as little, little educated. Uh, maybe, maybe less formal education. Less formal formal education. education. Um, right. We had some who very little education, very little knowledge of the world at right. all. Right. Uh, working class, uh, people who are really poor. I mean, and you know, one coming up through the foster system. Yeah. So lots of lots of of um, differences there in terms of of sort of where we come from, particularly around class. We're much less um, diverse in terms of race, but particularly around class. Uh, sister Four actually was uh, uh, begun be to be assistant treasurer because treasurer is all it's the hardest, and it's the most work, and it's the one that some people just were afraid of most. Especially if you have 13 to 15 right. different background women coming with all kinds of ideas, but the special thing about it was that everyone expressed those ideas or concerns, whether it was minor or major, or kind of out in the universe, <laughs> or just very practical. Activism is in Herland's DNA. The founders of Herland were veterans of the civil rights movement, peace movement, health care activism, feminist causes including the battered women's movement, the campaign for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, pro-choice movement, and other progressive activism. The women of Herland continued to be activists in all these movements, and in the early 19th participated in some of the most important protests and actions of the era. In the summer of 1991, the anti-abortion group Operation Rescue led a series of protests and blockades of clinic entrances in Wichita, Kansas. Herland women traveled with members of the Oklahoma National Organization for Women to join pro-choice activists from across the country in a counter-protest. There was a doctor in Wichita that performed abortions that had um, a clinic that had been highly, highly um, protested against and the abortion laws were beginning to get rolled back and uh, this is at, I, Tiller I guess is his name, he's the doctor that eventually got murdered at his church. There was a group of anti-abortion people with signs there were right up by the door to the clinic there were 
crosses, you know, white crosses stuck in the ground and you could not walk down the sidewalk into the clinic without passing by these fanatical anti-abortion people that were in people's faces. So, so at one point we're doing that and the anti-people are sort of maybe crowding around us and I don't know if I came up with it or somebody else said let's go sing the mountain song. Um, I, truly I don't remember because once we started walking and I started singing I was sort of in this I'm just gonna call it a spiritual bubble I I really you know what music can do to you and we felt so tight and so in such conviction about how, how important it was that we were there showing that we were pro-choice and we weren't going to let them take over that day anyway and I'm singing at the top of my lungs and when I'm singing I you know you just can't touch me right and my friends were like crowded in around me and I, I recall that some of them seemed like they were petrified because we are walking down into the middle of this these religious fanatic you know but we're singing and my friends who always sang with me some they were singing at the top of their lungs and I'm singing and then and this guy is right behind me like murderer blah, blah. and I realized I'm singing ain't gonna let nobody turn me around and I'm not facing him so I turned around and I sung it right into his face and it it was like Oh, God, it was so powerful. By the early 1990s, abortion rights had been eroded by 12 years of Republican activism. Women from Herland joined nearly 750,000 people in Washington, D.C. on April 5, 1992, in the March for Women's Lives, organized by NOW. On Friday, April 3rd, Herland women boarded a sleeper bus chartered by the Oklahoma State Chapter of NOW for the 26-hour trip from Oklahoma City to Washington. After picking up more riders in Tulsa, the bus was full and on the way to Washington, D.C. According to one rider who described the trip in the Herland voice, it was without a doubt the most uncomfortable 52 hours of my life. It was 52 hours of the most enjoyable hours of my life also. Thinking back on it, I would say it was like feasting on mom's melt-in-your-mouth fudge while getting whipped with a cat of nine tails. Whatever, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. The early 1990s were also a momentous time in the struggle for the protection of LGBT civil rights. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was the Clinton administration's solution to gays and lesbians serving in the military. Its effect was that LGBT people could serve as long as they remained closeted. The 1993 March on Washington for Lesbian, Gay, and Bi Equal Rights and Liberation drew over a million people to Washington, D.C. Herland women traveled in two bands to the March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights to demand civil and human rights for LGBT people. As described in the Herland Voice, we went to Washington for visibility on a grand scale. For one brief weekend, LGBT people were the norm. We were everywhere, in the subway, in restaurants and hotels, and on the streets. We demanded a federal civil rights bill protecting our rights and celebrating our community without fear. A banner reading, A Simple Matter of Justice, hung from the March on Washington stage. In Washington and in Oklahoma, we announced that we would settle for nothing less. Local activism by Herland Women in coordination with other organizations included a series of demonstrations in 1993 at the Lower Deck, a bar near the OU campus in Norman. The bar owner advertised, Ladies' Night, No Dykes. 
and refused to serve women she believed to be lesbians. When asked to remove the no dykes from the sign because it was offensive, the owner refused. Women in the Herland community were part of the initial incident and the subsequent protests. The chair of the Norman Simply Equal organization, a local LGBT rights group, met with the owner who made it clear that she did not want lesbians in her bar. Following that meeting, a group of about 30 people, mostly women, went to the lower deck for a dyke inn. They entered the bar as a group to drink beer for ladies' night. The drink special sign had been changed, and the manager informed the group that they would have to purchase drinks to stay. After purchasing drinks, several women danced together on the dance floor. At that point, the owner turned up the lights and announced the bar was now closed. Other customers were escorted to a separate room as the owner called the police. When the police arrived, members of the Herland group were escorted outside, where they chanted in protest before dispersing peacefully. Protesters gathered again a day later, despite threats of violence from the bar owner and encouragement of violence by an Oklahoma City radio disc jockey. Many of the women who had been expelled from the bar filed complaints with the Norman Human Rights Commission, but the commission dismissed those claims. Within a few months, the lower deck had closed. One of Herland's efforts that had the most impact on the local level began in 1992. A Cleveland County District Court ruled that a mother was unfit because she was a lesbian and removed custody of her two young children, placing them with their father. The judge's ruling said that he was removing custody because the mother's lifestyle was immoral and she was creating an immoral environment for her children. The mother filed an appeal and asked Herland for support with the court expenses. Because of the possibility that the case could set a precedent recognizing parental rights of lesbians and gay men, Herland established the Herland Legal Defense Fund to raise funds for the appeal. The National Lambda Legal Defense Fund joined Herland in its efforts. Nearly $20,000 was raised to support the appeal using benefit concerts, bake sales, cookbook sales, and the Dust Bowl Lullaby CD and direct mail fundraising appeals. The Court of Appeals affirmed the trial court ruling and the mother appealed the case to the state Supreme Court. In July 1995, the Oklahoma Supreme Court overturned the district court ruling and thus set a precedent that a parent's sexual orientation was not enough cause to remove children from the home. For its efforts in support of Fox v. Fox, Herland was honored as the Outstanding Community Organization of 1992 by Pride Network Incorporated and by the ACLU of Oklahoma with its 1997 Human Rights Award. Yeah, that's something that we were really proud of. Um, a woman came to us with a story about how she was about to lose her kids and she needed money to hire a lawyer. And so several of us said, yeah, we think we can raise some money for that purpose. And uh, we have some very talented musician friends. We had at least seven or eight different women um, who regularly were involved with her land activities and so they all did one of their songs on the on the CD and um, of course we sold it at the bookstore and that kind of thing but I mean we there's a woman um, who is still performing she wrote her very first song on for that album and she's still performing that song to this day well you know I mean, it really is it's so different because, like, last weekend, it's just last weekend, I think, I was at the Women's March, and you know, there are people all around me, and women holding hands. I go to the ball game at OU, uh, and I see women walking down through the concourse holding hands. We thought we would be killed if we did things like that. I mean, really. Um, that that we lived with that kind of fear, there was no way we would have been publicly demonstrable. There's a there's a song that uh, um, Meg Christian did, and I 
I forget the name of the song or even the context, but among one of the things she says in the song is you only touch the ones you love. And for me during those times, that meant you literally didn't touch anybody unless it was safe, unless you knew you were in a place where it was okay. So the, the concerts, the building, the Herland building itself, the events that we did, later on the retreats, all of those were places where, where women could be, feel free to be themselves without, uh, without that kind of constraint. That women can come together in a safe place, discuss ideologies, have resources like books and music, movies, and know that they are not alone. And, and because of that, uh, her land becomes a beacon. And it's a beacon of hope. It's a beacon of security. And that's important. I mean, for me, it's a place where I made lots and lots of good friends, and I still have many of those friends. Um, it, it was a safe haven for, for women, and um, many of the women wouldn't be around today if it wasn't for what Herland did for them. So, I mean, that kind of legacy and just helping protect people and get them through. Because we were a wonderful bunch of women, and that's the truth. That's the truth. Herland, when I was there, never got picketed. I don't know if I'm upset about that or what. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got so many churches in Oklahoma City, you could throw a rock, and even if the rock scattered, you could hit three more churches. <laughs> but we never got picketed. But I was hopeful of that. I was ready for that when it did happen. But a lot had to happen to get to these free spaces. And I like to think that some of the things that Herland did um, has made it work. Almost 35 years after its inception, Herland women continue to be active in seeking equal rights and justice for women and the LGBT community. The Herland Bookstore is used for discussion groups, potlucks, movie showings, and the annual Pride Picnic. The bookstore is also rented two evenings a week by a local counseling and mental health nonprofit to provide a social support group for queer youth. No, you can't just take my dreams away without me fighting. No, you can't just take my dreams Back in 1982 I thought I'd stay a month or so Till I figured out what to do Now some years later I'm like a sailor washed ashore The questions I was asking then Don't need answers anymore I found the people I was looking for Back in lonely days gone by Out to change the world Day 
daily work fighting uphill battles these are life's great pearls these are the kind you'd be glad to find on a journey when you need a friend if you got to leave you won't stay gone long you're bound to come around again found the kind i was looking for i found them sooner fine they sing to me i sing to them dust My little cat They make me marbles hand painted so fine He had a bar where I sang for the hat They followed me round Cheered me on I'm a cheering them on too That's the way That we have learned To keep us muddling through These are those I was looking for We walk the same tight wire We love to play And work and sing There's the one with the pretty voice Sing so sweet on key Someone lives in my old house Someone takes my picture for free Stay up late like we were young again And everything ain't gonna be alright I found them without looking They showed up on the slide Singing loud and clear and free to spoil Just